Hi everyone, welcome to our first talk today, Saturday in Los Angeles B. Uh, first a word from our sponsor, uh, it's from MaxCDN. MaxCDN is a next generation content delivery network based in Los Angeles. The whole team is obsessed with speed, automation, real-time reports, and implementation. And if you want some bandwidth through their CDN, go ahead and head over to maxcdn.com for a free trial. Um, our first talk is going to be from Dustin Kirkland. It is rapid video transcoding on an Ubuntu orange box. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for the patience. Uh, over the last few minutes, I was setting, setting the box up. It involves a bit of setup to get it to the point to where we're ready to, to demo this. So uh, if, you, if you came early, you get to see a little bit of the, the guts of this behind, uh, behind the curtain. Um, so out of curiosity, who's here to, uh, to learn about transcoding? Who's here to see the orange box? That's what I thought. Very cool. Absolutely. That's slide 17. We're going to get to that. <laughs> um, has anyone seen Code Rush? Old documentary, old 2000 documentary. Um, the IMDb uh, entry right here. It's 7.4. It's, it's a pretty good, pretty good documentary. It follows um, what happened with Netscape Navigator uh, after AOL acquired Netscape. Uh, right around 98, 99, 2000 was when uh, Microsoft put IE directly into the operating system, right? And now, you know, it's hard to imagine a browser that's not part of your, your OS. But when, when Microsoft did that, they were, they were sued, antitrust uh, litigation, major antitrust litigation, because a browser was a product that was not part of the, the operating system. Um, and so Netscape's reaction to that was actually to open source Netscape. And that's, you know, very apropos for our conference here today at, at scale. We're celebrating open source, and Netscape was one of the, the first and the biggest and most um, user-facing pieces of open source software out there. Code Rush itself, in the spirit of open source, is actually licensed under a CC, uh, a, a Creative Commons license. You can download Code Rush um, for, an, sorry, so Netscape became Mozilla, and Mozilla is what we know today as, as Firefox, just sort of linking the chain. If, if you've never heard of, of, of Netscape or wondered about the, the um, how that came about, you should definitely watch the movie. In the movie, you can download for free. You can go to archive.org, Internet Archive, um, and there's a, a link right there where you can start downloading, downloading it this very instant, uh, CC by NCSA, uh, uh, which means it's Creative Commons. You can download it for free. You can't sell it. Uh, and if you share it, you should have to share it with the same the same license. And it's it's wonderful. You can download it in three different formats. In fact, MPEG, a little bit uh, bigger MPEG, and AUG video. Now, uh, when I did that originally, um, in my Firefox browser, I was absolutely baffled by by this error. This is a, a Firefox browser trying to watch, and this is a modern Firefox browser, Firefox 21 in. Ubuntu, a modern Firefox browser downloading the, the, the movie about the coming of age of Firefox, freely downloadable in, uh, in free formats, uh, I thought, um, and I wanted to play it on my, on my system right here. And this is what I, this is what I saw. Um, in fact, you've probably seen that message before and wondered, WTF, right? It's a family-friendly conference, so which transcoding format is this, right? That's what you were, that's what you were thinking, okay. Um, which transcoding format? What, why do I even have to think about this in the, modern, in the modern era, in the modern day and age? It's actually really complicated, and this, um, this chart oversimplifies it a little bit. I got this from the, the W3C, the, the W3 uh, consortium. Um, you know, it lists a couple of browsers, IE and Chrome and Firefox, Safari, Opera, um, and then the various formats and what's supported and where, and look, there's some caveats here, and you know, you're trying to, to wonder about this. Does anyone manage content? Our sponsors we heard from uh, do CDN, content distribution, manage content on your, on your site. Um, compatibility across browsers is important, certainly, right? And you put a lot of effort into the HTML and the JavaScript and the CSS to make sure that all comes together. But guess what? The new web is, is less about the, the, the static content and so much more about the dynamic content, the videos and the, 
and the audio and the interaction with it, right? Um, and it's actually kind of compli complicated to, to get it right. Uh, and these are three different ways of sharing videos and how they're supported in HTML5 compliant browsers. Now, you'll see a bit of uh, a, a very important footnote, in fact, um, down here. Video formats, there's more to it than just the extension, just .mp4. If we go back a couple of slides, you'll see very clearly that what I'm downloading is a .mp4, and that's supported in Firefox, right? Look, MP4, Internet Explorer, Chrome, Firefox. Look, this column has the most yeses, so it, it clearly must be the best. Does anyone use Opera anymore? I don't even know where to find Opera. But look, we got yeses across the board. And I've got a few caveats right here. What, what went wrong? Right? There's a couple of pieces to a video format. Uh, one of them is the container. Uh, and I'm going to oversimplify this a little bit just because we could have an entire session on video formats. One of them is the container, and that's usually what we think of as the extension. So the MP4 container or the WebM container or the AUG container. And then in a video, there's at least two different portions, two different streams inside of that, that video. There's the video and there's the audio. And they're both encoded using different codecs. Codecs are a way of compressing uh, video and audio so that it can be it can be transmitted and and um, and and used efficiently, right? <clears throat> so H.264 is one video codec. Uh, we can call it the the leading free-ish codec. Uh, you'll also see this in Linux, uh, referred to as X.264. Um, the important aspect about it is that it's it's very modern, it's very fast, it's very efficient, and it's very high quality. You can actually uh, transmit really good quality high definition in H, uh, H.264. Uh, from an audio side, there's also uh, an audio codec that is managed separately, but those two are combined together in a single, uh, into that single stream, into that single MP4 stream. So I ran uh, AVConf, which is uh, it's, it's sort of a, a, a fork of FFmpeg. A um, lot of lot of drama in the open source community about FFmpeg. It became AVConf, and now FFmpeg is back. For the sake of this talk, everything that I've done here is AVConf, uh, which is a, uh, a derivative uh, of FFmpeg. You run AVConf-i on any given um, media file, and it'll tell you a bit of information about it without playing it or transcoding it or anything. And I can see. Right here, very clearly, this is a, an, an MPEG-4 video. That's great, right? So far, so good. Um, and I can see here that my audio is uh, an AAC compressed audio. And that's great, right? Um, but then there's the kicker. This video was uh, encoded in a YUV420P stream. YUV420P is a way of... of uh, picking the color in the pixels and, and defining what that, what's going on in that video at a given time. The important thing is that that says YUV420P and not X264 or H264, which means we need to transcode that video. We need to take it from one format and turn it into uh, another, another format. And I'm sure you've seen this. These are screenshots from iPhones and tablets and browsers and various operating systems, and it all sort of says the same thing. One way or another, look, we can't play this video, which is just so annoying, so frustrating, right? So here's a magic command that you can run on, uh, on, on any Ubuntu system where avconf is installed. Uh, libav is the open source project. App get install libav tools. Um, you run avconf on an input file. You tell it the video codec is libx264. That tells it which library to use. Which audio codec? Uh, AAC. Um, another really complicated uh, option that uh, basically says we're going to use H.264 inside of an MP4. Uh, the output format is going to be an MPEG stream. I need that for the, the demo that I'm going to do later. That's not necessary in, in all cases. Uh, strict experimental, um, it says to use these two together, and uh, yes, overwrite that file if it exists. You can run that on any video. In fact, I took that Code Rush video and ran it on my, uh, my shiny laptop right here. Uh, it's a dual core, hyper threaded i7, so um, you know, high-ish end on the desktop side of things, but certainly not a workhouse, workhorse uh, workstation or anything like that. And that took uh, 23 and a half minutes to transcode, uh, a 60-minute long video, an hour-long 
uh, video. Um, in fact, I also just last night uh, transcoded the same exact the same exact file um, on one of the nodes on this machine, just a single node, right? Just uh, one node. And it's, a I, it's an i5 with a a little bit a uh, little bit more RAM, a little bit more um, more. This is a very much a CPU uh, uh, CPU processor bound and I/O bound process. Again, it took 20, 21, 21 minutes on this on a single system to do that. But I actually have a cluster of machines with me, a cluster of physical systems. So this is the orange box portion of the talk. This is the Ubuntu orange box. Has anyone not heard of the orange box before? This is your first awesome. I love love talking about this. So it's a striking machine, isn't it? I mean, it's just it's it's it it has like a it just pops, right? What is it? It's actually a portable cluster. Let that sink in for a minute. There are ten physical nodes inside of this chassis. Uh, you know, it weighs oh 20, 30 pounds or so. It fits in this flight case. Uh, I fly all around the world with it. In fact, we've got a, a, a dozen or so of them at Canonical, and uh, our, our sales engineers have one with them at all times. We send them to conferences. We put them in uh, in, in in booths and in, in settings like this. Uh, we'll even loan them or rent them to customers and partners sometimes when they need some equipment to, to do some testing or development on. Um, so it's 10 nodes. Uh, the nodes themselves are Intel Nooks. Anyone have an Intel Nook? Tiny little machine. Yeah, they make great great little uh, video uh, video uh, gaming boxes or little boxes attached to your, your, your TV. I bought, I bought about three of them uh, a little over a year ago and started playing with them, and I made a very small open stack cluster out of the three. Um, I blog about it, and I work for, for Mark Shuttleworth, who has a bit more resources than, than most of us in the room, and he said, that's awesome. Go find a way to put 10 of those in a suitcase. I want 10 of those in a suitcase, and I want to wheel them around, and this is what came out of that, out of that challenge. Um, so every single node has uh, a dual-core hyper-threaded i5, so it looks like four CPUs to the operating system. Um, every single node has 16 gigs of RAM. Every single node has a 120 gig SSD inside and a gigabit NIC. There's a 16 port switch, gigabit switch on the inside. It's a managed switch. We can do some fancy stuff with VLANs and uh, network shaping. Um, half of the nodes have additional storage. Um, and the master node, one of the nodes, has uh, Wi-Fi. It has an extra NIC. And it also has um, its 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 outputs wired to the back. Oh, and it also has a two terabyte spinning media hard drive, uh, which we use to, to cache a bunch of data on the system so that we can take this around and you know, not use uh, the, 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 the network as, as much. Um, that's sort of what it looks like underneath. Um, all the nodes themselves, uh, the CPU and the GPU fit up against the, the aluminum heat sinks on either, on either side. Uh, so none of the nodes, not a single node, has a moving part, which is pretty amazing. Uh, the only moving parts are uh, there's one fan in the back which cools the power supply. There's a single 20 volt power supply that sends 20 volts to every one of the the boards. We use the pin on headers for each of the boards, um, and that one spinning media two terabyte hard drive. That's the only moving parts in this whole system. It's silent. This thing's running at full bore right now, and I mean unless you're standing right here, you, you really can't hear it. I keep this on my desk sometimes, and it'll run uh, all day long. Um, it tops out at about 210 watts. Uh, the power supply is rated for 300. The most I've been able to draw is about 210 watts. Um, uh, and it's not something that we sell. They c you can buy them. They're about $12,000. We have them custom made for us from a, a company in the UK called Tranquil PC. Um, Canonical is not in the hardware business, but uh, we, we had these boxes built for us on a contract so that we could fly around with a, with a cluster. Um, in, in about 10 minutes, we can deploy almost any workload you can imagine on this. Uh, Hadoop, we can wipe everything off of it and then deploy OpenStack, wipe that away, deploy Kubernetes, wipe that away, and deploy transcoding, which is what, uh, what we're looking at here today. Any questions about the hardware? I'll pause for a second. What's that? <laughs> Yeah, it's it's expensive. It's a it's a little pricey for the home the home the home server, um, but for what for what we're using it for, uh, it's great. It's a it's a it's an incredible machine. Yes, sir. Um, so it varies in different configurations. We've actually moved from secondary S SSD to actually little uh, tiny 
uh, flash drives that we just plug into the USBs on it. All we really want out of a second disk in our configuration is to have two disks on a system. So that in, especially in OpenStack workloads, where you want to put, uh, you need a root disk, but you also need a secondary disk as your, your victim for, uh, for, for Swift storage or Ceph storage or something like that. That part is totally configurable and optional, I guess is what I'm saying. You can build one of these boxes at tranquilpc. Uh, .co, .uk, and you know, put however much storage you want in it. In ours, we have a 120 gig SSD and a 32 gig flash media, so real small. It's, that's, that's really not the, 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 the interesting aspect of the orange box to, to us for our purposes. Hardware questions? Yeah, absolutely. They'll build it and ship it to you in, I think it's four to six weeks lead time. Um, yeah, uh, there's, there's, there's a you know, I don't know how many of them there are in the wild. I'd imagine a few few dozens, maybe a couple of hundred. Um, they're they're quite useful in places where you need portable compute. Um, so uh, I know of a, a company using these in oil fields in Texas, where they're, they've got big data and lots of data, but getting gigabytes of data off of a, a uh, an oil rig in outside of 500 miles away from Lubbock, Texas is kind of hard to do, so they can crunch the numbers on the box local and send the answer. Yep, there's oil here. Hi. <laughs> Come drill a bigger hole. <laughs> Can you elaborate on the uh, graphics card? Yeah, so there's not much of a graphics card in this. It's uh, it's an Intel 3000 GPU. It's on board. on board Intel. Yep. In fact, we're not using GPUs in the demo here today. Um, so it's not all that impressive. Uh, there's certainly better graphics GPUs out there. There, there is one. It does okay. It keeps up. Um, so here's what we're doing uh, today. We're taking Juju, which is a uh, service orchestration, uh, open source service orchestration developed by Canonical. Um, it's a very intelligent way of deploying workloads to public clouds, private clouds, and bare metal. And here today, we're deploying a workload, LibAV, our transcoding software, uh, through something called MAS, another open source project from Canonical. MAS stands for Metal as a Service. What MAS does is it puts basically a REST API on a data center of hardware. This is a very tiny 10-node data center, um, which might be as big as you know your, your home office or small business. But MAS can also put that same API on tens of thousands of physical servers. Um, and then what, what Juju does is it asks Maz, give me a machine or machines that look like this, this much RAM, this much CPU, uh, put those workloads here and tell me when, when the system comes up. So what Maz does is Maz itself is a collection of a bunch of open source software that runs a DHCP server, a DNS server, um, a Pixie server, there's a squid proxy. Um, it's everything that you've probably set up in a, in a small network where you're the network administrator, um, but it's one app get install MAS away as opposed to going and finding and configuring bind and configuring uh, DHCP and configuring Pixie. It's all that done for you perfectly. As this gentleman asked right here, just because I'm doing it in an orange box and you don't have an orange box yet, um, you actually can use the same open source Juju, the same open source charms, and deploy that same workload to either bare metal if you have it, or any public cloud. <clears throat> Amazon, Azure, Google Compute, we've got a, a list of others, uh, Joyent, uh, Softlayer, there's, say again, HP, HP Cloud, absolutely, uh, and OpenStack. Actually, I neglected to put OpenStack on this, on this slide, um, and that's one of our most important clouds. And that one's important because you can run it, run it locally, you can run it privately. Um, anything that you can deploy with Juju, and there are hundreds of charms, George and, and Marco here in the back are uh, authors of, of dozens of these charms. They've, they've written many of these charms. Um, any workload that you can deploy with Juju, the beauty of Juju is you write that charm once, and then it deploys everywhere Juju works, and that's public clouds, private clouds, and, and bare metal. So this, this transcoding thing, if you've got an account in any of Amazon, Azure, Google Compute Engine, you can set this up and deploy the same job yourself in, in a matter of minutes. But here what we're talking about is Maz and Juju. So Maz Metal is a service, but Juju is going to do the deployment itself. Uh, I'm going to switch over into the demo mode in a second, but I captured this uh, just to, to talk through a little bit of what, we, what we're going to see before we, we dive into it. Um, so the design of what we're doing here um, is transcoding a video, and we need shared storage for all of the, all of the nodes. So all of the nodes, um, one of the nodes is going to run an NFS server. 
right? Anyone use NFS? I still use NFS at home. I've got all my media and videos and, and, and pictures and everything shared around the house on, on NFS. It's quick, it's simple. Um, most importantly, everyone, you can set it up so that everyone can both read and write to it. A lot of the other ways of sharing file systems, it gets real difficult to do concurrent reads and writes, but NFS actually works pretty, pretty well at that. There's a lot of things it doesn't do well, but that's one of the things it does do well. So we've deployed NFS to one of the nodes, and it's exporting uh, some of that 120 gig SSD storage, right? If you did this in production, maybe you'd want to put the, uh, the NFS server on your system with you know, tons of storage. Here we're just talking about a, a couple of fairly small, um, a couple of fairly small files we'll, we'll transcode. Um, the transcode charm, you can run that on a single node, which is what I did when I timed it at about 21 minutes. Um, or scale that out. I'm running it on almost all of my nodes. I got one dead node uh, here, so we're we're gonna uh, just like any real data center. You have some nodes that 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 die or they're they're sick and need uh, need a new disk or RAM or something like that. We've got one node that's that's uh, misbehaving right now. Um, we can also set up Ganglia or Munin or Nagios or any of your monitoring systems that Juju already supports to monitor these these guys. Um, and I did that. I did that last night, and uh, or sorry, not last night. I did that uh, recently, and you can actually watch the job come across and see the network traffic, the CPU load, the uh, the disk I/O, uh, and you can watch your jobs and how they how they how they spike. Monitoring is a beautiful thing. It it really makes a, a geek like like myself uh, get get pretty excited. All right, so who's ready for for the demo? Yay. Right. All right. Let's see how this works. So I'm going to flip over uh, to a Firefox browser here. And in fact, I'm going to show you just what we saw. So if I hit F5 and try to refresh this page, I've got coderush.mp4, and I get this message from Firefox. Video can't be played because the file is corrupt. Well, it's not corrupt. It's just you don't know how to, how to, how to, uh, how to read that file. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over to my Juju GUI. Juju has both a GUI and a command line. And for some reason, I don't have icons today. I'm sorry about that. But trust me in that this is transcode and this is NFS. And if I click on the transcode, oh, first of all, let's, um, yeah, let, let's, let's kick this off. So if I click on transcode and I go into the configuration of the charm, Marco? Okay. Hmm. Service settings, transcode. That's not working for me. I can run it from the command line. Yeah, run from the command line. Everyone loves the command line, right? Yeah. yeah. So normally we can just type a URL in right here, but that's not working. Of course it's not going to work. We're in, a, we're in a demo situation. So on the, uh, in the transcode uh, charm, there are some configurable items in it. Um, did you get transcode will tell me what's configurable. And here I have a, a URL to something that I would want to transcode. Now I'm going to actually change that to our code rush. So I'm going to run juju set. Help me. Transcode. Uh, in, input URL equals, and I've got a local copy of that uh, code rush, the one that we just tried to, to do so we don't saturate their network. I'm going to set that value, and that's going to kick off a job. So I'm going to very quickly jump over to one of the nodes, and I see a brand new job just pop up in this job directory. So I'm going to click on this, uh, and I'm going to refresh a couple of times. Uh, first of all, the URL is set to to that, and let me just make absolutely sure that's the right URL. Yep, that's the one that we can't play. Um, and I'm going to refresh this a couple of times. Did that did that take all the way? The juju set. Yep. Set and forget. Okay. Uh, we'll need to give this a second. What it's going to do, it should download that uh, should download that file, 
and start the, start the transcode process. So let's take a look at what the transcode process actually looks like, what the source code looks like. <coughs> so one thing I was surprised by, I was surprised when I started, um, yep. All right, hold on a second. Let me let me do this instead. Is that a little better? Okay. Um, so one thing I was really surprised by is that there there it was actually pretty hard to find a transcoder that worked well in a in a parallel scalable manner. I had a bunch of nodes, and what I'd like to do is chop up some videos into much smaller pieces. And, and do that do that transcoding itself. Um, there's something called Handbrake that supposedly works pretty well. I, I had trouble getting that to, to work well, at least on, on my cluster. So what I did was I, I sat down, I thought about it, and um, and uh, and my yeah, it was it was about 23 minutes. I used Handbrake on that same machine, and it cooks the Yeah, you're welcome to come up and touch this uh, uh, when you're when you'd like. This this runs just uh, as cool as a cool as a cucumber. It it really is a nice, cool, efficient, um, nice, cool, efficient. Um, um, let's see. All right, we got a, we got some some tearing here, so I need to take a look at that. That didn't happen yesterday. Um, but I'll tell you what we can do. We can look at our logs and get a get a feel for whether we had errors or not. And yeah, look at this. We have error header header damage not 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 working. Right. Um, we can try a, a different a different video. And uh, let me kick that off in the background. We'll start transcoding something else, and then um, and then I'll I'll take a couple more questions. So let's see. Cat, read me. Here's some examples. Has anyone seen Big Buck Bunny? It's uh, won some awards back in the day for uh, uh, some really impressive um, uh, uh, rendering. Um, so let's run that. So Juju set, uh, Juju get transcode. Actually, I got the whole command right here. And look, we're going to actually resize this one from 1080p to 960 by uh, 540. So I'm going to run that command. Uh, that might take a minute to download since it's going out to the internet. Um, and that job is now going to start here in the background. Uh, any other questions while this runs? <coughs> slides, yes. Yeah, slide so Scale is publishing the video of the talk. Um, this and the slides. I, I, I just exported the slides to PDF. Um, if you follow my my Twitter or my my blog feed, uh, I'll publish them there too immediately uh, after. So um, yep, the codes all, one, you everything you saw here is 100% free and open source code. All of it. Uh, Juju, Maz, Ubuntu, libav, the charms, um, everything it took to put this together with the exception of Google Docs, uh, I think is completely 100% free and open source code. And the bash, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, so it, it would need, it needs to operate on a complete file. Um, so you'd need to like break that file at points, you know. Like if hypothetic, I think they've got a pretty sophisticated setup here. I know Elon works on uh, <laughs> works on 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 video for his uh, for his day job, so I think they've got a pretty sophisticated setup. But let's say <clears throat> what I'm talking, I'm speaking in this camera. If that camera were to like take snapshots in periods in time, it absolutely could work on those snapshots and have them up very very rapidly. Uh, and you could do that in the cloud and, and so forth. In fact, uh, the, the way this, this actually came about, um, I was here in, in Los Angeles about a year ago uh, at Digital Film Tree, um, who's a, a big OpenStack uh, user. So Digital Film Tree is, is based in, in Hollywood. Um, they have a couple of products used by some of the film studios to, um, 
to for for editors to comment on uh, a a video while it's in production, right? So they shoot some video, and then the editors go through and can can mark up, hey, there's too much zoom in here, tighter crop there, change the color here, whatever. Um, and while I was talking to them, I was really curious about what kind of tools they were using, uh, and I you know I made a comment like, yeah, I'm sure you guys have some really fancy transcoding. Uh, I just use FFmpeg, and they got really quiet and they said. We use FFmpeg, <laughs> and so I thought about. It, I was like, "Oh, well, great. So, what do you do for like your tra your, your parallel transcoding with FFmpeg?" And they said, "We don't. We just, you know, put a big machine behind it and give it a bunch of time and and let it go." And so I said, "You know, have you ever thought about you know trying to parallelize that?" Uh, and they said, "No, we we haven't." Um, so uh, you know that's that's where this came from, and and it was a kind of a weekend weekend hack. Um, the the other screenshot here, um, which I got pretty annoyed with, um, was was this sort of situation, you know, where uh, I've got two little girls and they you know like to watch um, like to watch like to watch movies, you know, and and having uh, videos that I've purchased and trying to play it on different on different devices, it just drives me nuts when the format breaks, right? Uh, and so what I decided to do was go through go through everything and uh, I you know did a did a bit of research to on what was going to be the format that that work with uh oh it's not good I uh, did a bit of research on what format was actually going to work with um, with most of their devices and and that's sort of how I settled on the the MP4 um, MP4 uh, H264 AAC and uh, so I just transcoded my entire entire library to that. That and you know all the videos that we take in with our phones and our digital cameras. You go through some spit out MOV, some spit out M AVIs, and I just kind of took it all down to MP4. Yes, sir. Uh, good, good question. So Matroska is MKV, I think, and so that's a different container format. So that's sort of the outer shell wrapper. I think with Matroska you can use H.264 and you can use AAC inside of Matroska, um, but the container format, the wrapper, is not an MPEG, not a motion, um, you know, not not an MPEG. I, I, that's as far as I can go on that question. <laughs> Sorry. A couple questions. Yeah. Do you find any issues when you're parallelizing uh, the fact that you actually split the file up and you're Yes, I was hoping to do that. I was going to do the math on, I, I see that it looks like, uh, my computer just went to sleep, and I'm not sure why. So, what I was gonna, what I like to do when I do this talk is actually do the math. How long is this video? Divide by seven. Find the like the the seam. And um, what I've experienced is that most of the time you can't even see it. If you know what you're looking for and you're right there and you watch it a couple of times, you'll go, oh, maybe maybe that was a a little seam. More so when there's a lot of motion. You know, you're in a you're wa it's a football game or something like that. I think so. I think it's I think it's part of the, the just the concatenation process, right? This job ended here, stopped, the next one started there. It's right now has a resolution of a hundredth of a second, but you know, sometimes that's that's not enough to take care of really high res video in frames. Would I would I do this in production for the for like the most important, you know, we're Thank you guys for being here. There's also a talk about Netflix, uh, you know, next next door. Um, I'm sure they've got something much more sophisticated than this. And I think if someone wanted to put a little bit of effort into it, this is a 90-line shell script, right? Um, I think if someone wanted to put a bit more effort into it, you could probably productize this into something a little bit more robust. This was a weekend hack on a Sunday morning after I'd just come back from Europe, and I woke up early in the morning because that's what you do when you're jet lagged. And I said. You know, I'm gonna try that. Try to hack on that transcoding problem. I was, I've been kicking around. So yeah. So I, I mean, it may not be, it may not quite be the quality that you would want or expect in something production. I, I actually think the, 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 the pixelation and distortion that's that was coming about there is because my laptop's in 1280 by 720 right now, and I'm being required to do this in 1024 by 768, and things are a little weird. Oh, yeah. So I'm uh, sorry. I had a had an X Windows crash. Um, sorry about that. Um, kind of related. Uh, what was the overhead on the concatenation? Yeah, extremely fast. Um, 
really just as fast as it takes to, write, uh, to read and write that amount of data over the gigabit network. So when we did the, and my screen's frozen, so we're going to stare at this. Um, but when we, did the, uh, when we did the math on that, it was 21 minutes, right? And then we looked at how long it took. And then I think what I saw was uh, about three minutes and 20 seconds. Um, so a little over the, the three minutes that we had estimated. That 20 seconds was basically how long it took to read and write that 200, and 200 meg file or so. Um, gigabit's fast, but it's, it's not as fast as local, local storage. S SSDs are fast, but SSDs over gigabit is not as fast as, as local storage. You know, a good SSD, you should get about six gigabits per second throughput, and on a network, you're, you know, one gigabit. So. Um, yeah, that part was the fast part. You do this on a much larger, bigger video for the sake of this demo, I carefully chose, well, for this crowd, I chose the Code Rush uh, video, which is interesting. Um, I chose a, a file size that I knew we could knock out here in, in, you know, four or five minutes or so. But you do this on a, you know, much bigger video. It'll take longer, but it'll take a hell of a lot longer if you're doing that on a single node as opposed to on all the nodes in the cluster. Yes, sir. Yeah, exactly. So that that command is in the bottom of the. Here, let me uh, let me get this. I'll get this back up here in just a second. Um, yeah. So there's there's an avconf command at the end that then sews them back up together. It's at the at the very bottom. Only the master node has to do that job. So it, when the master node is done with its job, it knows that at least one of the nodes is done. And it waits for all the rest of the nodes to be done by checking in every four or five seconds to see if if everyone has hit touched their, their done flag. Uh, and then there's an avconf command that concatenates them all together. Frankly, that was actually the, the, the hardest part of writing the, that, that, that bit of code, right? I've done, a, I've done a bunch of parallel processing code and that like touching flags in an NFS directory is the old school way that we've been doing that since like Beowulf clusters in the early 2000s, right? Just everyone reads and writes into a directory and you know, touches a flag when they're done. Um, the hardest part was actually um, the figuring out the somewhat Byzantine interface of FFmpeg and avconf to figure that out, or to, to figure out how to put those files together. Um, and then the, the uh, sorry, this is what you get for running bleeding edge latest and greatest unreleased Ubuntu. But look at that. We're right back to where we were because we had our entire session saved in a, in a, in a Tmux window. Um, oh yeah, so we were going to look at that, that source code. So uh, examples, transcode, hooks, transcode, and at the very bottom. So this is how you concatenate it back together. You run avconf with the concat command, and you can actually concat a, video, a lot of different videos using this if you've got everything lined up correctly. Some things are serial streams and some things are not. You can only concatenate uh, streams of, of video. Um, so the other important aspect is in here, this bit. Uh, this bit, these two bits right here together. The fact that we're 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 spitting this out to a streamable, stream consumable uh, video, and if we do that, then we can concatenate. And so that's sort of the the magic two parameters that I'd encourage you, if you're curious about, to go and read the avconf man page on this parameter and that parameter, and then take a look at what's required for concat. You look confused. I'm sorry. I, I, this is not, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Sometimes, yeah. If, it, if it's the right MPEG stream, yeah, you can just cat, and then you can pipe those to M player and just watch them all in series. Um, what I can tell you is that if you leave off this piece, you don't end up with an MPEG stream. Time code, yeah, time skew. You know, time, time code marker, um, 
Uh, good question. Uh, I I don't know the answer to that to that question. I'm sorry. Um, that might be. Uh, we may have some information about that in the in the log files. Um, Yeah, so let's let's pull up the log and see if we have any information about that in the log file. So, oh, we've got our big buck bunny as well. Uh, that one might be a good one to like see if we can see the the break. Um, let let's take a quick look at this first. So logs. Um, so this is our concatenation job. So this is the bit that runs at the very end where we concatenate all of our different pieces together. Um, can you tell me a keyword I might search for to, to see if the, the time data is in here? Uh, time code. Oh, code rush. TC, no, no, no hits here. I do see I have some continuity check problems, so this would be a case where I'd want to go and be very careful about Making sure this video is what I expected it to be before I, you know, deleted the source videos or something, something like that. Um, let's try the one other one we did in the in the background here. This one's a little little cleaner, a little smoother. Um, and let's do a little bit of math and figure out. So it's 10:02. Uh, so 10 times 60 plus 2 is that, divided by 7 nodes, so about at 86 seconds, which would be a, a minute 26, we'll have our first seam. All right, watch very carefully. So it looks like we have a, a, our sounds off a little bit there. All right, so yeah, it's not perfect yet, <laughs> but uh, we're getting there. It's fast. It's, fast. <laughs> it's not perfect, but it's fast. You're right. That's true. So if the audio is so that that's a, that's a fantastic question actually, and and something I've got in the to do. We could actually do the audio transcoding separately, and that might be a, a safer way of of doing it. Um, we could do all the audio transcoding on one of the nodes or on another node. The audio is typically very fast to transcode. We will want to make sure that we get the audio, like in this case, from AUG to to AAC or something like that, so that we we come back to a um, the the right combination of formats. But that's a fantastic suggestion and something I've got in the, the to-do list right now is to actually take the audio out of the, the transcoding and do that separately and then put it back together as part of the, the concat job. And that would probably be a, a little bit a little bit better in, in the long run. Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. So I've benchmarked this. Uh, these nodes run about as fast as M1 extra larges in, in or M3 extra larges in Amazon, uh, which is Amazon's equivalent of four cores, 16 gigs of RAM, and SSD local storage. Um, and so the the question is really, how much are you willing to pay? Uh, you could run it. You can do it. You know, if you really, if you can shell out, you know. Um, uh, whatever, seven, eight dollars an hour, you could run it on one of their cluster compute with NVIDIA GPUs and, and probably not even need the trans, not even need the parallel uh, transcoding, just do it all on one giant instance. Um, you could do it on a whole bunch of smaller instances, M1 smalls or something like that, which run a little slower than, than these. So it's really about choosing which instance size, and that's mostly a cost consideration, you know. Nate? 
Uh, yeah, just over email. Like I, I, I have a blog post about it. I send it to them, and they said, "Hey, that's cool. We'll, we'll take a look at it." You know. Well, that's all I have. Thank you very much for uh, for coming, and appreciate the feedback. Thank you.